Welcome to the Skeptic Zone, the podcast from Australia for science and reason. Yes, it's the Skeptic Zone podcast, episode number 666. Mm. For the 11th of July, 2021, 66611, mm. It's all arbitrary anyway. Or is it? Find out. Our first segment today is You Can Count on Adrian with Adrian Hill with special guest Kelly Burke. And Adrian and Kelly will be discussing 666. Why is it that 666 seems to crop up a lot? Mm. Following that, it's the Book of Tim with Tim Mendham, and this week's a bit different Book of Tim. This week I will interview Tim about what it's like to be at the Skeptics' Headquarters, the main uh, contact for the public and the media for Australian Skeptics, and what it's like to put together each quarter the Skeptic magazine. Then it's the return of Maynard with Maynard's Spooky Action, a very short report this week about a mysterious new type of uh, meditation healing product called the Broadway Singing Bowl. Then to round off the show, it's once more into the Trove archives to look for references in reports to psychic animals. Is your cat psychic? I think the cats here, the Skeptic Zone cats, must be psychic. They know when it's dinner time. They really do. Now, folks, I've been having a very interesting time since Sydney is in severe lockdown at the moment with COVID cases sadly on the increase with the Delta strain. I um, splurged a little bit and I got myself an interesting sort of VR headset. And last night I was floating around the International Space Station and uh, grabbing satellites and things with the Canada arm and going outside on spacewalks. It's truly amazing. It really is. Unfortunately, the food on the space station leaves a lot to be desired. But what I would rather have, one of my favorite foods is some Kung Pao chicken or lovely spicy Chinese food and, uh, what was it, the Sichuan chicken and things like that. Mmm, absolutely delicious. Something maybe like spicy beef, noodle soup, Japanese curry, spicy hot pots. All sounds pretty yum to me. I'm just going to sit here and think about all those things because right now it's a little difficult to go out and get them. I suppose I could have them delivered. I don't know. Well, I do that. While I do that, I hope you enjoy The Skeptic Zone. You can count on Adrian with Adrian Hill. week in honor of the Skeptic Zone 666th episode, I thought we should look into and have a little fun with this infamous number. I had so much fun working with Kelly Burke last time, I have invited her to round up some 666 stories so we could compare our findings. I'm so excited that Kelly's going to be here again. Welcome, Kelly. Hi, Adrian. I'm excited to be back. And Richard doesn't know. This is a surprise to him, too. Exactly. We thought we'd uh, surprise him a little. In our last meeting with the Australian Psychic Prediction Project, he actually said, hey, Adrian, you know, you should work with Kelly more often. So I was kind of smiling because we had this in the works already. So (laughs) it's pretty fun. First, a little bit of history. I was not really that familiar with the history of this number, but a lot of you probably will be. And according to Numberphile on YouTube, which is one of my favorite YouTube channels, and I'm sure Richard will be putting the link to this very good video in the show notes. According to Numberphile, the biblical reference comes from Revelation chapter 13, and it says, Let him who has understanding reckon the number of the beast, for it is a human number. Its number is 666. 
This can be looked on as a riddle. The word reckon in English comes from the Greek word to calculate, and Hebrew numbers have a corresponding letter, and that's how they have their number system. And so it would be like assigning the number one to A and two to B, etc., in English. And if the letters of the leader of the time, Neron Caesar. In Hebrew, are written as their corresponding numbers, and the numbers are added together. Guess what you get? Six hundred and sixty-six. And it could be considered as a way of saying that the leader of the time was evil without actually getting into trouble. Anyway, the only thing that I found really interesting was that the sum of the first thirty-six natural numbers, in other words, one, two, three, four, and so on, all the way up to thirty-six. If you add them all together, you get six hundred and sixty-six. Which actually leads us nicely into the roulette wheel. Now, the roulette wheel, particularly the Monte Carlo roulette wheel, was invented by Francois Blanc, and he was said to have made a deal with the devil to determine the secrets of the game, since the numbers on the table are from zero to thirty-six. And I'm sure you can see why the devil was involved, based on what I just said. Where if you add up all the numbers one to thirty-six, it equals six six six. Obviously, zero to thirty-six also adds up to six hundred and sixty-six. So I learned something fun about that. Oh, so there's a special name for that type of number, which is a triangular number, because you can make a pyramid out of them if you make each layer going up a descending number. So it's a triangular number, and then it's also a doubly triangular number because thirty-six is also a triangular number. I don't know what's special about it being doubly triangular, but oh, well, there's some extra <laughs> extra math trivia for everybody. Did you find anything else fun? About I did. Sixty-six, Kelly. I do have one more fun number fact. Awesome. It is if you write it in Roman numerals, it uses all of the letters in descending order. So it's D C L X V I. That's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> Only you and I would find that really cool, but hopefully some <laughs> listeners. Exactly. Okay, enough with the math. <laughs> oh wait, I do have one more. Can I sneak one more in? Sneak one more in, please. It's also the sum of the squares of the first seven primes. Oh, that's awesome! So somebody was having a lot of fun. This was like a whole page I found with tons of. Fun math facts about six sixty six. Someone was just having a lot of fun trying to add random crap together to make six sixty six. I think, and it just goes to show a little bit too that if we look for it, we can always find something, which leads into that sort of confirmation bias. I think what was really fun when we decided to take on this project, we started seeing six 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 everywhere. And I think you—the first thing you did—you texted me when you were on holidays at the beach, and you had kind of a fun thing happen there. Yes, so I was playing Uno with my little cousin, and I swear I didn't do this on purpose. But just what happened to end up in my hand when I played a card was six, 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 all of different colors. And it goes back to that like Bader Meinhof phenomenon, where like when you learn a word, you hear it everywhere. Exactly. Once we were hyper aware of it because we were going to do this segment, we realized how many six six sixes we found all around us. And I was in the process of filling out a prescription at the time when you sent me that text, and I looked at the prescription, and it was seven numbers, and the three in the middle were six six six. So it was really funny how heightened we were with that. And then we were golfing on the weekend. And those of you who don't like to golf, hopefully you'll understand my reference here. But my husband, on the first three holes, shot six, six, six. And if you're a, a golfer, you'll know that maybe that's not the best score. He was actually seven over par after three holes, and you think maybe with the number of the beast being part of it, maybe he would continue to play poorly. But no, he actually recovered quite nicely and had a really good <laughs> round. But we, I just thought it was really funny that we decided to do this segment, and then my husband shot six 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 on the first three holes. If I were golfing, I probably would have gotten six 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 on the first hole. He did better than me. <laughs> <laughs> and another thing that I saw, I saw a tweet from secular humanist Vila Bianca, and it was quite amusing because it said, "Be warned, Ken Ham. We just booked plane tickets to Kentucky for the Tri-State Freethinkers Ark Encounter protest on July 10th. The cost of the ticket seems auspicious." 
and the cost of her ticket was six hundred and sixty-six dollars and six cents. I thought that was wonderful. That's perfect. I wonder what Ken Ham thought about that. <laughs> Hopefully he saw it. I really hope so. Have you ever had in the past any interesting encounters with the number 666? Or did you find any online that when you were looking? So I found some fun ones online. I found a website called hauntedplacestogo.com. And they had a whole page about Highway 666. Is it in the US? So it is in the southwest region of Colorado. But I think it goes through multiple states. It looks like an interstate. Uh, it looks like it was actually renamed, though, to 491, I guess, because of the stigma <laughs> of 666. It's like that thing where they don't put a floor 13 in a hotel. They don't want to yes. have a highway 666. So there are a bunch of stories. The first one they have called Satan's Sedan. It says, one of the most widespread stories surrounding the unexplained phenomenon of the haunted highway 666 is the story that covers the experiences that involve an ominous black sedan that appears to charge individuals driving on this long stretch of road. Many individuals that have traveled this road have stated that as doing so, they began to experience an intense degree of fear as the sun sets on the lonely horizon within their view. And funny that this black sedan shows up after sunset when every car looks black because it's dark. <laughs> anyway, once darkness falls on the desolate road, The witnesses claim to see headlights coming up behind them because, you know, that never happens on the road, right? <laughs> Despite no, the fact that they reach high speeds, the car seems to gain on them quickly. Many pull over in order to get out of the way of the dangerously close vehicle. Many witness the vehicle speeding fast past them. Others look up to view the vehicle and discover that there was no vehicle at all. Is this a hallucination induced by the desert or does Satan truly intimidate travelers in a mysterious black sedan? <laughs> Because if I were Satan, that would be my primary concern, scaring people off of my highway. It's interesting how the stigma of that number can cause things to change. And it's really interesting. Many years ago, actually in 1995, we were moving from Vancouver to the Edmonton area. And we were looking for a home. And there was a really beautiful house that we looked at. But as we were walking up to the front door... I noticed, and we all noticed, that the house number was, you guessed it, 666. I hope you bought that house right away. <laughs> you know, I think if we knew we were going to stay, we probably would have just because it was a beautiful home. And what a cool number to have, especially when you're not superstitious. But we were only supposed to be in Edmonton for two years. And so we had to consider resale. And so we didn't buy it, even though we we're not superstitious and we weren't worried about the number. We decided not to buy it because we were worried about being able to sell it again because we knew so many people are suspicious. So there's oh, a harm there. I wouldn't have even thought of that. That poor yeah. person selling their house who's probably encountering a lot of people who are like, oh, it's a lovely house, but I don't think I want to buy it just in case. Exactly. And so that, that, that is a harm of, of superstition for sure. This was told to me by my friend, Adrienne. What a great name. And she's also a math teacher. It's so cool. Aww. So she told me about this. She's a hiker. She loves to go hiking in the mountains here. And we live you know, about an hour and a half to two hours from the mountains. And she told me about a local hike at Prairie Mountain. And people have a love-hate relationship with it because at the top, you're rewarded with this beautiful 360-degree view. But to get there, you have to climb 666 meters elevation change Ooh. along, I know, along a 6.6 kilometer hike. So there's a lot of sixes going on there. That's great. You know what's funny about that, though? If it were in the U.S., there would be nothing significant about it because we would have measured it in feet. Exactly. That was going to be my next point, Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> So I have one other thing that I wanted to talk about, and this might be my favorite. Uh, this isn't an accidental 666, but an intentional one. Because Ooh. earlier this year, Lil Nas X put out a music video for his new single, Montero, Call Me By Your Name. And for those of you who haven't seen it, go watch this music video. It's incredible. He's talked about how, as a gay man, he has been demonized by the church. So he made this whole video that kind of uses those Christian themes, but has him coming out on top in the end. And it's absolutely fantastic. 
and also made a lot of super religious people freak out. So that's even more reason to go and watch it. But in addition to this really incredible music video, he also put out shoes, which I'm sure you've heard about. He put out 666 pairs of his shoes that he designed himself, and they went on sale for $1,018, which was a reference to Luke 10, 18, uh, a passage about Satan's fall from heaven. These shoes were so cool. They had pentagrams on the heel. So I guess when you stepped, it left like a pentagram design in the ground. Uh, And they had an inverted cross on the tongue. And every shoe had a drop of human blood in the sole. I remember people kind of freaking out about that a little bit. Yes, which Nike ended up suing because I think they had like the something that looked like the Nike check mark. So I'm not sure the status of them now, but they sold out instantly. I think they were actually Nike shoes that he used. Oh, were they? And, and that was the problem, yeah. And he'd apparently done that before with another promotion, but they didn't bother about it too much. But this one got attention, so they cared. It got attention. <laughs> if I were the type of person to spend $1,000 on shoes, I totally would have gotten a pair. Yes. Kind of like the 666 house, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> I wouldn't mind talking right now about something I did find that was, I thought, really fun as well. Somebody making use kind of like the shoes that you were just talking about. In 2012, so a while ago, a New York food truck decided to serve, quote unquote, devilish new menu item. It was a $666 burger that they decided to call the douche burger. (laughs) And it was made up of Kobe beef patty wrapped in gold leaf, had foie gras, caviar, lobster, truffles, my favorite, melted Gruyere cheese, melted with champagne steam. Oh, wow. <laughs> so they like- didn't put champagne in the burger. They just no. wasted the champagne melting the cheese. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If I had crazy billionaire money... I might invest in a 666 burger, burger, but even that seems excessive. Exactly. And according to this article that I found, but at the time it was written, they'd only sold one, but the sales of all their other burgers went through the roof. So it was a bit of a marketing ploy. And all of their other burgers on their menu were $6.66. So they really had fun Oh, that's great. So they made other people buy burgers that cost $6.66 to avoid yes. spending $666 on a burger. <laughs> I love stuff like that, though. It is. It's very, very creative, right? It's, yeah. Well, what I think is really interesting, just like in my previous number topics, like three, the you know, good things happen in three, bad things happen in three, how there's always this counterbalance of good and, and evil that can happen with a number. I found that in China... 666 is actually considered to be lucky. And Ooh. according to Wikipedia, it, that number is often displayed in shop windows and neon signs. So there's a, another example of where culturally you can find it both sides, that it's a good luck number or it's an evil number. So if I want to buy my 666 sign, I can go to China. Now it's time for all of you to notice all the 666s in your life that have been there all along. And it's time for me to go upstairs and make myself a 666 burger. Drinking. Hey! Oh, drinks. Hey. Mm, so nice to be back at Skeptics in the Pub. Yes, Richard, it's great that COVID-19 is a thing of the past and we can gather together and not wear masks. Although I, I will occasionally, you know, like, you know, in special situations, you know what I mean. Mmm, this, this beer tastes better than I remember. And uh, this beer glass is much bigger than I remember. Mmm. Oh, thanks for this. I- I'll get the next round. Ah, no need. All the beer is free tonight. Free? <laughs> Oh, wow. Did you hear that all the anti-vaxxers and flat earthers have changed their minds? What? Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're, they're now busy writing apology letters to the whole world. They're really busy. They're going to have to sharpen their pencil, if you know what I mean. Ah, oh, look. It's Lara coming over here with a, a plate full of food. Hi, you two. Did you know that the food at the bar is free tonight? Anything you want. Really? You have to try the lobster and chips. Lobster and chips? Oh, wow! This is like a dream! And this pub now has recliner chairs, a free foot massage for everyone, and vouchers for Uber rides home. (laughs) Wow. 
Hang on. This seems too good to be true. Who's the guest speaker? It's not bloody Brian Dunning, is it? Let me see. Uh, this is odd. It says here it's the sceptical fairy godmother angel from the internet. The sceptical godmother fairy... In- you know, you know, that sounds familiar. <coughs> oh, <wow. coughs> Smoking it up, woman. Hello, everyone. Who are you? Well, you're only 10 centimetres tall. That's about four inches for those of you using the uh, Darth Vader Imperial system. And floating in the air, that can't be right. As Lara said, I'm the sceptical fairy godmother angel from the internet. Ask a silly question. And you're tonight's guest speaker? Well, not really. I have come to tell you that, yes, this is all a dream. Aww. Aww. I thought this was too good to be true. I know we can't meet in pubs at the moment, but that shouldn't stop you from enjoying sceptical talks online. The Vic Skeptics have Skeptics Cafe each month. Sydney has Skeptics in the pub. There are online events from the Gold Coast and... Yes, yes, this all sounds eerily familiar. Have we met before somewhere? Maybe we have. Maybe it was as we watched a live and interactive sceptical talk. All you need do is search for them online, no matter where you are in the world. She's right. I've been watching sceptical talks from the UK, the US, and even one from my own living room. Although that one wasn't very interesting. I fell asleep and I was the speaker. Hang on, hang on. Weren't you once the tooth fairy? (sighs) I'll never live that down. One last question. Yes? Just whose dream is this? <laughs> Mine. Goodbye. <coughs> Worse than sparklers. She disappeared. But um, we're still here, huh? Right. So, um, lobster and chips, anyone? All right, now it's a dream you want to pay for everybody. <laughs> Now, a reading from the Book of Tim with Tim Mendham. Yes, it's the Book of Tim with Tim Mendham, and joining me on the line because of lockdown, I can't be there to record Tim this week. It's Tim Mendham. Hi, Tim. Hi, Richard. Hi, Tim. Uh, how's lockdown treating you? Oh, it's all right. Thank you very much. I'm actually locked away in the bathroom at the moment, and I refuse to come out. Well, that's always a good policy, I think. Tim, now, listeners know you uh, come on frequently to read from the Skeptic magazine, the journal from Australian Skeptics, in the Book of Tim segment. But I was wondering, and maybe my listeners are wondering too, what it's like in your day-to-day job there at Skeptics headquarters. Uh, Let's get to the magazine in a minute, but you... You're on the front line, aren't you? You're the guy who answers the phone call when people ring up Australian skeptics. You must get some interesting calls from time to time. I get some very interesting calls from time to time, actually. I you know, have to say that um, they run the gamut from very friendly people. I mean, you obviously get all the subscribers and people like that, which are good to talk to. People who have been around for ages and, and newbies, etc. And we you know, like to talk skepticism. But then we get the people who are coming in for the challenge. Mm. And this is the $100,000 challenge that we offer to anyone with a paranormal power that they can prove. Um, And we get some very strange people who think that just by saying they can do something, they get the money. We have to say no. It's actually a little bit more involved than that. And they Mm. have to get through the tests and scientific tests and things like that. But some of the claims that people make are very weird. Um, which is probably a bit, yeah. Again, yeah you you yeah. shock me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, it's it's. But, but we get a lot of um, people who are water diviners. They're okay. They're fine. They're yeah, you know, sort of cool people. They're nice, you know. Um, but we get a lot of psychics and people who can do telekinesis and things. And half the time, when they explain what they're doing, we have to tell them how they're doing it um, in reality, and then they never hear come back to us. They don't. Yeah. They don't like that. 
Uh, we get a few UFO people and things. It's sort of your face is hard because you think is that actually your skill or is it just you happen to see something? Yeah. We did have one person who reckoned he was covered in UFO dust. UFO dust. Yes, and uh, he also said he saw UFOs in the sky and filmed them. Um, and you couldn't see them, but they were apparently there. Um, he sent a lot of videos over. Um, he also reckoned that uh, the shadow of a contrail was black matter or dark matter. Well, that's an and interesting one. It was an interesting one. I had to point out it was a shadow right, <laughs> on clouds, et cetera. But it's, it's the, 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 the usual story is that um, I, I would get people coming in or phoning in or writing in at least once a week, I get a different person. Yeah. Uh, sometimes more. And then I, when they realize that they have to do a scientific test, they um, drop out. Most of them would drop out straight away. Um, and they say, you get about, you know, 10% less left um, who might be serious enough to actually say, yeah, let's proceed. And then we say, well, what can you actually do and how would you test it? And then they've never thought of that. They just uh, claim they have their, their skills and they can, uh, that would be enough to actually show it. But we say, no, we've got to do it under strict conditions. And about then we get about uh, 5% or about half of those would drop out very quickly yeah. when they can't figure out how to do a test. And then we go to a, a small number, really, and uh, who actually you know, are keen to do a test, and then we can work out some sort of rough protocol. And when we do test them, they can't go any further than that, unfortunately. Uh, we've never had someone go to the final big $100,000, no. here's the check test. Yeah, we've, got, we've, got a, we've probably done about 200 or so tests over the years. Yeah, I seem to recall sometime in our history there has been the very rare time where we've waived the preliminary challenge, the, the preliminary part of the challenge, Maybe I'm misremembering, but by and large, uh, as just to remind everybody, you have to pass a very uh, informal preliminary test before you go for the money, and nobody has even come close to passing this informal part of the test. Yeah, it's it's pretty straightforward. It's a fairly simple one, just so that we know what their claim is and what they how they do it. Uh, we are not necessarily how we debunk it, but if we were to debunk it, but how they reckon it happens in the mm. circumstances. It's just so we understand what the environment is for a test. And then we, if they pass that, if they indicate there that there's something sort of worthwhile following up, we then go for a serious test. Yeah. And so far, we've never been for that serious yeah, test. Yeah, we haven't. And it's also worth remembering that it's a prize. I mean, okay, we call it the challenge, but ultimately it's a prize. You know, if you can do this, you get a prize. Uh, if you can swim the ocean in a certain amount of time, you get a prize. If you can do this feat, you get a prize. So it, it is a prize. And it's 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 interesting to note that, yes, many people haven't even ever considered a test or to test themselves or anything. They simply automatically assume they have these abilities. Yeah, they do. It, it, it is a prize. So it's real money. It actually exists. Um, it's amazing how many people say you know, they don't want the prize. They don't want the money that mm. would uh, pollute their skills. We say, well, give it to a charity. Give it to a friend, <laughs> whatever. That's okay. We don't care who you give it to. But uh, And then we get uh, psychics who say, oh, I, don't, I wouldn't uh, accept that sort of money. It would be you know, terrible. And then we say, well, how do you earn a living? Mm -hmm. I'll be taking it to that. But, yeah, uh, yeah. so I mean, it, it is a prize, and it's basically to someone who can do what they say they can do. Yeah. It's and as simple as that. It's, it's very simple. It, it's, the old, it's the old story because we've been doing this for so many years, and I, and I do like the ones that when they can't perform as claimed – one of the standard excuses is, well, you can't test what I do. Yes, yeah. <laughs> or, or that's, some of that start off with that, actually. Um, and yes. sometimes the claims are so vague. You think, well, how do I test this? You know, yeah. What are you actually doing? Well, I can't tell you. Yeah. You think, oh, right, that's not a good start. <laughs> I've had that. Literally, I've had that. And, yeah, I can't tell you because it's a trade secret. Yeah. And you think, <laughs> okay, thank you. Bye. We well, can't go very far. With well, the other one is like I've heard from homeopaths is we we know it works and we're waiting for science to catch up. That's that's a yes, great one. Yeah, yeah, I mean it's uh, some of those things that I get. I get a lot of people who, uh, as I say, sort of telekinesis is of all this, of all the the, the people who come in challenge. Yeah, telekinesis is quite common. But people think sticking something to their chest, like a spoon. You're oh, using demonstration. Yes, people yes. stick spoons. I've had someone stick a uh, an, an iPad 
to their chest. I said, don't do that because it'll an drop iPad. off any second. An iPad. That's a yes. new one. Yeah, no, I, I actually sent a video of that and um, <laughs> it, it did drop over after a while. Um, he also reckoned he can make books fall over. Mm-hmm. Um, but basically they were the flimsiest little books, obviously balanced on, on you know, upright on the, on the anything would actually make them knock, knock over. And it's, some people come back to you all the time. They keep coming back with yeah. new ideas. Hey, I've got this one. I've got this yeah. one. And then you have to say, no, I've seen that 3000 times and this is how it's done. Or yeah. this is why it happens, etc. And, um, but I still treat them all. I treat them individually. I write back. I'm very polite. You, are, you know, And yeah. I say, well, what can you do? And the, one of the issues, of course, that um, people hear about us around the world. You know, our challenge is, you know, pretty famous. And the Australian skeptics are pretty famous, quite frankly, around the world, mm. you know, because we're very active. But our test is only for people who uh, live in Australia because it's our yeah. test. Yeah. And we have to do the, the, the test set up, et cetera. And it's not going to be any good for, to rely on someone else overseas to do the testing on our behalf. Yeah, and fair, and fair enough, too. I mean, there are the prizes overseas. If someone's in the United States or in Europe, they can find local uh, people there who have large sums of money. Yeah, and some people say then, oh, well, you're not serious. I think it's yeah, the money's there. But, you know, then they said, can I move to Australia? <laughs> you say, well, at the moment you can't. Right. <laughs> no, but, not much chance of that, no. But uh, the other thing is that, uh, yeah, really we wouldn't recommend that because it's going to cost you a bit, you know, even in good times, it's going to cost you a bit to come here. You've got to set yourself up. You've got to live here for a while. And we would really, I mean, knowing full well that, that the chances of their success being blunt is is rare. Um, we're not saying no one can do what they claim they can do. Someone out there might be able to. Yeah. But the chances of succeeding means they're going to put a lot of expense into this and not going to get anything out of it. In any case, we'd have to work out the entire protocols before they even approached us. Yeah. And yeah. as we've said, that can be very difficult for some people. Now, apart from answering the phone, of course, Tim, and doing some of the day-to-day routine stuff, that is necessary for any organization like the Australian Skeptics. You are the editor of The Skeptic, that fine journal from Australian Skeptics. I have in my hand the very latest issue at the moment. Issue number, well, I should say it's volume 41, number two. And That's this right. is represents um, over 40 years of continual into 40, publishing. Into our 41st year. That's a so you want to work out 40 times 4 is, is a 160, is it? Plus a couple of here and there. So um, Plus a couple of here here and there. That, that's and, astonishing. Of course, it, it started off as way back in 81. And for a long time, our, our good mate, uh, the late Barry Williams, was the editor of this, the magazine, of course. But you, you were instrumental in the very early days, weren't you? I was. I was there, actually. I was only five years old but, <laughs> uh, when it started. Um, but... Uh, yeah, the, the, the original for about half a year, half a, year, half a decade, uh, it was being done out of Melbourne, mm. really where the, a lot of the sceptical movement started of, you know, was got where the active people were. And then uh, when some of the active people went on to do other things, we it, it was moved up to Sydney, which is where, and then I took it over at that stage. So from about uh, 85, 86, somewhere around there, I, I took it over to edit it then, being that's my job. Yeah. professional job, yeah. um, and I did it for another five years. And then Barry took over after that for one issue, he said, and um, then he would uh, he'd pass it on to someone else. So he did it then for the next 15 years. Yes. That was the one issue he claimed. Um, he, he loved it, of course. He loved he, it. He loved the fame and fortune that you get from being an editor of a skeptic. <laughs> he did. He, uh, he, 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 en- he enjoyed being he, uh, being recognised in the street. And one of his great joys was at Christmas time because he 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 was a dead set ringer for Santa Claus. So kids would look at him and think he was Santa Claus at Christmas time. I think he enjoyed that. I've actually got a, I've actually got a picture of a, a Christmas card from him with a photo of him with his with a stick raised in the air saying "Bah humbug." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he took it that seriously. But, no. yeah, so then I took it over then in the late, about 2009. Yes, that, that's about right. Now, I'm just glancing at this latest issue. It only arrived in my uh, letterbox about a week ago. Uh, and But I also uh, get the online version, which is 
the same thing but as a PDF. And listeners, you have the choice. If you subscribe to the magazine, you can even get the physical copy, which I have in my hand now, which is great for reading. Well, I'd like to say it's great for reading on trains and buses and out and about, but we can't go out and about at the moment. So it's great to read in your favorite armchair. Or you can peruse the version uh, sent to your inbox and you can subscribe at skeptics.com.au. How do you go about each quarter, Tim? Where do you get your stories from? How much do you rely on maybe listeners to send you ideas? A lot. I mean, uh, to, to for any editor, it's sort of contributions so, uh, worth their weight in gold mm. or worth their, worth their e-weight in gold. Yes. Uh, um, yeah, it's, it's basically I, I love to hear from people who have got ideas for articles, etc., or book reviews or letters to the editor or opinion pieces or yeah. news items, reports on meetings, that sort of thing. We cover a whole lot of range of stuff, and people can see what the magazine looks like on the website. Yes. Um, and most of the issues you can download for free. So you yeah. get a good idea of the sort of things we cover. Um, then people can email me at uh, editor at skeptics.com.au and mm-hmm. discuss what they have in mind. It's good to write first before you write something. Yeah. We might have already covered it. We have people who occasionally send me a book review, and we said, sorry, we actually reviewed that book last issue. Yeah, yeah. So it's good to check first. Um but then what I do is all these contributions come in and I put them in a pot and throw them up into the air and a magazine comes out. <laughs> a miracle. <laughs> it's it's a... Only, only. Um, we go through a lot of process, obviously, receiving uh, stuff, juggling, deciding what goes in, uh, what the feature will be, the big feature every yeah. issue. Yeah. Have one, we have several articles devoted to a particular topic. The most recent issue that you've got in your hot little hands right now is right about now. Uh, yes. why people believe. Yes, Ideas. So sometimes we have that sort of philosophical themes. Other times we have uh, physical things. We had a big feature on uh, UFOs and particular a particular case in uh, Australia called the uh, Nullarbor plane. The, um, yes. UFO. Yeah, and there was Famous. a lot of stuff about that. And I, I enjoy every every quarter too. I try to send you a few contributions myself. Uh, the latest one in this magazine is my report about Mind Body Wallet, and the article is called "The Return of the Unwelcome Prodigal Son." And it's just my adventures, which were covered on the Skeptic Zone, but in print, so people can read uh, all about that. And that's that's a nice little one pager, uh, a report. If people are out and about and they see something crazy or they've got a point of view, yes, by all means, write to Tim and pitch your idea. You never know; you might be in print. Yeah, I mean, so we even print some of yours occasionally. Yes, occasionally. That's a... <laughs> no, we also do take stuff. We actually, you know. Um, unashamedly lifts lift stuff from the Skeptic Zone because there's do. always good quality, good quality stuff on the Skeptic Zone. Some of the interviews and that sort of stuff uh, we, we use. We don't want to use everything. And uh, you occasionally take things out of the Skeptic magazine as well. So. well. Well, I mean, I must say that uh, that's what the whole Book of Tim segment is normally about, is you reading from the pages of the Skeptic, but uh, you're reading your own your own work, basically. Most Sometimes, of the, yeah. Most of the time. Yeah, because that's, that's always the most interesting stuff, you know. My own work. Your own work is always the most interesting stuff. But yeah, no, it's, it's, I, I do read from other people, and the, yeah. and the things I tend to read out in the book of Tim are the things that are sort of are fairly uh, not time sensitive. You know, they're, they're yeah. perennial topics that that just can be read at any time, and yeah. they're not, not like, like a news item or something like that. So we've had a, in all those forty plus years of stuff, we've had some pretty interesting articles and items written you know, for the magazine, and there is a plethora of stuff. It, it, it is. It is extraordinary when you go and and consider that 40 years' worth of articles, reports, interviews, and so forth, and it's searchable. So if you go to skeptics.com.au and type in the search box, the area of interest you have or the name you're after, you will probably find something in the pages of the magazine that relate to it. You will find something about everything. Yeah. I I wouldn't type in in a a common word like skeptic. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> like a hell of a lot of responses to something like that. So well, try and be try and find something pretty uh, well, unique. It's, it's like if you typed in James Randi, you'd get many, many returns. But I, I remember typing in things. I mean, when I'm doing research for stories, I'll go there and type in the, the topic I'm sort of interesting in, oh. uh, interested in, maybe iridology or what have you. And it's a, it's a wonderful uh, – it's like – me going to the Trove Archive every week for stories for the Skeptic Zone. I'll also go to the Skeptic's uh, website, and again, it's, it's just a wealth of information. 
a wealth of information. A wealth and, of information. Yes, from from, from the, the whimsical to the to the very serious and you know from mm. the philosophical discussions about the underpinnings of scepticism all the way down to little green men. As I always say, why are they little and why are they green and why are they men? Maybe they they could be tall blue women next time. I just don't know. That'd be good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> invasion of the of the Neptune women. I think that's right. 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 They they can go hand in hand. All right. Well, Tim, thanks thanks for a lot for filling us in on your activities of doing the Skeptical Magazine. You must be at, in at the moment uh, putting your mind to the next issue. I am working on the September issue. So if people are quick depending on when this appears in the Skeptic Zone, of course. Oh, very uh, soon. Yeah. Oh, will it? Okay. Tomorrow, yeah, I think. <laughs> Tomorrow. Right. Tomorrow. Okay. Well, therefore, now's a good time. If you have an idea, write to me ASAP and say, Tim, I've got this brilliant idea that I've been yeah. gestating for years and years and years, and I'd love to write an article for the Skeptic magazine. And you know that we pay in round figures. Yes, I get paid in the same round figures for years and years and years for writing for the Skeptic yes. magazine. <laughs> And what a good deal it is. Uh, and I, I mean, broadly speaking, we're after things that relate to skepticism. I mean, we do go down tangents every now and then. But if you've got something relating to the paranormal or quack medicine or, or, or that realm, I think that's more likely to get a look in. But we also take people's opinions. I mean, we have a section called the forum, mm -hmm. which is sort of like a long letters um, section and uh you know people sort of as long as there's got some substantiation behind, yeah. this, behind what they're saying you know, there we and we have letters to the editors so sometimes it's it's heavy research sometimes it's opinion pieces sometimes it's reports on meetings book yeah. reviews have a look at the magazine and you'll see the, the range of stuff that we cover yeah and of course you have to be an australian you have to be an Australian or in Australia to do our challenge, but to contribute to the magazine, you can be anywhere in the world. Folks, visit skeptics.com.au. Look at the back issues, most of which are free for you to download and peruse, and you'll get a better idea. Well, Tim, i better let you get back to the very next issue, and thanks a lot. My pleasure. Hey, this is Dr. Carl, Carl Krasinski, proud to be a skeptic, and you can find out more about me at drcarl.com and get lots of free stuff there as well. Hey, Richard, Richard, hey, Richard, what? Richard, what? hey, what? Richard, Richard. What, is, what are you on, Maynard? What hey, is it? Mr. Stiff Shirt, huh? Skepti Man. Hey. Yeah, what, what, what? Hey, look what I've got here. What is, what is this? Now, you've heard of the Tibetan singing bowl. Yeah. Which is another sort. Just makes a sort of a bing noise. Listen to this. I'll just tap my oh. Tibetan singing bowl. Right. Yeah. Okay. That's a singing bowl. Well, sure, that can be relaxing. But who wants relaxing in today's world? Uh, I want a bit of tension. Yeah. I want a bit of showbiz. What? I want a Broadway singing bowl. A what? Which is exactly what I've got here. What the, what the hell? You just what? tap it. Yeah. And it does show tunes. Check oh, out come this. Come on. Give my regards to Broadway. What? Remember me to Harold Square. Um, and this. I wanna be a part of it. New York, New York. <laughs> okay. And this jaunty number. The magnificent men in their flying machines. They go up to the up top. They go down to the up top. So say goodbye to relaxing singing Tibetan bowls. Yeah, okay. Get yourself a Broadway bowl. Give my regards to Broadway. Remember me to Harold Square. If you're lucky, you might get some Ethel Merman. But, uh, Ethel Merman? There's no business like show business. Maynard, like Ma business. Maynard, where do you get these things from? Good grief. Oh, that's so oh, I'm so relaxed now. Uh, uh, okay, Maynard. Thanks. You know, i got to say, Bigfoot's BS, but the Chupacabra is totally the result of top-secret government genetic experiments on a remote island. Taking medical advice from Gwyneth Paltrow, like steaming your lady parts and putting jade eggs all up in there, is a great way to improve your health. Police from around the world regularly use psychics to solve crimes. They just don't talk about it. 
spontaneous human combustion is for sure a real thing. I've read all about it on the internet, and I worry someday it's going to happen to me. We all have friends and family who believe these things and much more. Well, if you're a rational thinker who is tired of arguing on social media and never getting anywhere, we have a solution for you. Join the Guerrilla Skepticism and Wikipedia team, and we will teach you how to add reliable scientific and skeptical information to the world's number one source of information, Wikipedia. We write new articles and improve existing ones. We remove pseudoscience, paranormal, and alt-med claims, substituting the actual facts. And we operate in many languages. We've already reached tens of millions of people searching for information, but as you can imagine, we can never do enough. So please join us. All you need is a PC, a Facebook account, and the desire to help educate the planet. In fact, you'll be educating the world while you sleep. Contact us at gsowteam at gmail.com. Guerrilla Skepticism. The, the time, time is, is now. now. Music by purpleplanet.com. Trove, you are the gift that keeps on giving. We've looked up so many strange and unusual things in the Trove archives, the online resource from the Australian Government and the National Library of Australia with digitised newspapers and so on. This week I thought we'd look up references in Australian history to reports on psychic animals. And you can imagine that a search for psychic animals returns a lot of results. So here are a few picked more or less at random. And the first story comes to us from the World's News. Saturday, the 27th of January, 1940. And this was a newspaper in Sydney, Australia. Psychic animals. Some scientists believe that animals are gifted with psychic powers and are often able to sense coming disasters. On the night before the Tokyo earthquake of October 1923, the howling of dogs in the city was so general that people were appalled. Many held that it was a portent of evil and disaster overtook them. 100,000 were killed, 150,000 injured and 50,000 missing. Rats often leave a doomed vessel before there is any sign of danger. Some time ago, in Assam, there was an invasion of Highland by thousands of animals and reptiles. Tigers, deer and rabbits loped along with each other, and when they all reached a safe level, a deluge broke, flooding the lowlands for miles. But the most remarkable case of animals fleeing from disaster occurred just before the island of Krakatoa was demolished by volcanic eruption. For days before, the water was black with swimming animals, all racing out to sea away from the doomed island. And the next item comes to us from Northern Times in Western Australia, dated the 3rd of April 1941. Psychic Animals Proof that domestic animals are psychic is to be found in the fact that few are killed or injured in air raids. A bomb which fell in one home district practically demolished an animal first aid post. Rescuers feared for the safety of a dog who was taking shelter. They found him merrily wagging his tail amidst the ruins. An ARP animal guard states that, though... In her district, cats continue to walk the streets during the bombardment. She has not heard of one being injured by shrapnel. And now here's one from the Daily Advertiser, Wagga Wagga, dated 1926 on the 30th of December. A Dog's Psychic Sense Here is a story of a true psychic. Born in June 1925, this wire-haired psychic terrier, Vic, was electrocuted on the Underground Railway on August the 9th, 1926, writes PAX in light. And the words PAX and light are in quotation marks, so I guess PAX is a correspondent or a reporter or something, and light might be a, a publication of some description. The first instance that Vic 
gave of possessing psychic gifts, was his last winter, when alone with me one Sunday evening, he began to growl and bark at someone, invisible, in the armchair by the fire, he lying there by my feet on the sofa while I read by bright electric light. At last, after invoking the high powers, I got up and sat down in the chair. Displacing as I did so strong psychic vibrations, while Vic looked on in great astonishment. I first used, quote, clairvoyance, end quote, by hearing that my visitant was my father, explained matters to him, and asked him, for the sake of people in the room, to go away. This he did, and at once the dog leapt from the sofa and smelt around the spot where the spirit form had stood. A few weeks later, M heard Vic playing about the garden, as with another animal. So, fearing a cat had got in, she went to the window and, quote, visualized, end quote, a very small black and white terrier playing with owls. After a few minutes, a noise in the next garden seemed to alarm the visitor, who disappeared where he stood and left Vic to whine and scratch on the spot. And, quote, astral, End quote, large white Persian cat curled up on the drawing room hearth rug was another cause of Vic's growls on several occasions, as he called M's attention to his enemy. On the other hand, he welcomed the delight of my sister's occasional visits, even jumping up to kiss the spirit's hands. Mm-hmm. After Vic passed away, at times we felt his presence, as well as hearing through the, quote, Sideric ring, end quote, that he was, well, and only taken away from us as being, quote, too human, end quote, but never saw him until September the 2nd. On that day, M, while at midday dinner, became conscious of a push against her right side, a way Vic had of calling her attention, and on looking around found him by her, well and joyful, wagging his tail. She at once petted something intangible, and told him how we missed him, and that the new dog could never be the same to us. The latter, meanwhile, retreating in terror across the room, until hidden behind a screen. He only rushed back to the table when his predecessor disappeared. Since then, Peter, the new dog, has given proof of seeing Vic, who on these occasions has not materialized. I thank God that we shall even meet our animal friends when we too, quote, cross the harbour bar, end quote. And what an interesting story from people who obviously, firmly believed. Now let's turn to the Herald from Melbourne, Victoria, dated the 4th of December 1943, under the banner of In Town and Out. Psychic Animals Most people who have anything to do with animals must have noticed at odd times their possession of a psychic sense. Nowhere has this been more evident than in the menagerie of Wirriff's Circus. I am told that when Jesse and Doll, the two elephants, returned to the circus after their long trek from Sydney a few weeks ago, all the animals parked in the circus by Prince's Bridge started a great hullabaloo of welcome when the returners were more than a mile away and out of sight somewhere at the top end of Elizabeth Street. Doris Wirreth recounts that at the time of her late father's death in Sydney, the elephants trumpeted piously for hours at Roma, Queensland. The horses, to which the late Mr. Wirreth was devoted, got into a state bordering on frenzy, and there was a definite feeling of uncanniness amongst the whole circus colony. Long before sick or stolen animals are returned to the lot, the other animals seem to know they are approaching. And now let's look into the Daily Mercury from 1939, the 2nd of March. And this was from McKay, Queensland. Psychic Experiments. London, February 18th, by airmail. Many strange ghost stories were related this week 
to a London audience by Sir Ernest Bennett, former Assistant Postmaster General and member of the Council of the Psychical Research Society. The Reverend Frederick Salt of Newbury, Berkshire, who is now in South Africa, told Sir Ernest of a visit to an aunt's house. While sitting at a table, Mr. Salt saw a cat beside his chair. He bent down to stroke it, but his hand met nothing. "'What are you looking at, Fred?' asked his aunt. "'Have you seen the family ghost? A cat?' Sir Ernest visited a husband and wife in a North Chester village. The wife said that night after night she saw a figure entering the room where she sat. Every night it put its hands around her throat as though to strangle her. She bore that, said Sir Ernest Bennett, with equanimity. Her husband was sceptical, but one night he heard his wife making an exclamation and turning around saw a man standing in the doorway. He struck at him and the apparition disappeared. There we go. A little story of a ghostly cat. And finally, the story you've been waiting for. And I've already posted this around the traps on Facebook here and there, because it's such a delightful story. From the Daily News, Perth, Western Australia, dated the 31st of October, how appropriate, 1936. Psychic duck in a trance. Prominent British scientists are being invited to cross the Atlantic to learn wisdom by sitting at the feet of a psychic duck that goes, it is claimed, into a trance controlled by the spirit of an Indian chief. Mr. Edward B. Coyne, owner of Cricket, a duck over which hundreds of psychically inclined Americans are raving, told me he wanted European savants to meet it. I've already written inviting members of the British Society of Psychical Research to come over and meet Cricket. When the organ is played, Cricket sings, or rather quacks, rhythmically, showing particular favour for, quote, Oh, the wings of a dove, end quote. Reverenced by hundreds, guarded and cherished like a million dollar baby, there certainly hasn't been anything in history like this fat, psychic duck. And there we go. Just a brief sample of the many entries over the decades and centuries about psychic animals and maybe their psychic owners. Next week in the Trove segment, we'll be looking more into reports on testing psychic ability. And you too can spend many happy hours wandering through the archives at trove.nla.gov.au and like me, you'll never know what you'll find. Thank you for listening to The Skeptic Zone. And as the skeptical fairy godmother angel from the internet reminded us in this week's episode, well, you can watch all sorts of skeptical events online. Uh, sadly, we only had one face-to-face -face meeting of skeptics in the pub all year. Then the COVID came back to haunt us all. Last, uh, last couple of weeks, a couple of weeks ago, skeptics in the pub, we had a very interesting talk by our friend Gideon Maivitz Katz about coffee. Is coffee good for you? And I've put a link to that talk in this week's show notes, Sydney Skeptics in the Pub Online. And we've had to make arrangements for next month, for the first Thursday in August. And our special guest speaker will be Professor Paul Willis. And his talk is Beyond Atheist. If you go to uh, meet up and search for Australian skeptics, you can find out more details, and it would be great if you could join us online, where you can ask questions of our guest speaker each month. Thank you to those people who continue to support The Skeptic Zone via Patreon or PayPal, which means a lot to the show at the moment, especially uh, my other sources of income have dried up once again because of the lockdown. My uh, 
other uh, part-time career as a part-time actor and, and so on is all on hold at the moment. And for the second year running, I'm heartbroken to say that the Mystery Investigator show uh, won't be going ahead because we just can't perform owing to the lockdown. And that's uh, too bad on, on many levels. One, it's a source of income every year, which has disappeared. And two, it means that uh, I'm not reaching hundreds hundreds of school students with um, the Skeptical School Show about water divining and a bed of nails and physics and optical illusions and all sorts of things. And I really like performing that along with um, my friend Maynard and uh, Ian Bryce and other people through the years. Hopefully, I really hope next year we can bring the show back. I think the best part of the show the kids like is when Maynard throws minties to them or Maynard stands on my back and plays the trombone while I lie on a bed of nails. But yes, thank you to those people who support the show at uh, SkepticZone.tv with your monthly or your weekly contributions. Thank you to Tim Mendham for that interview in this week's show. Tim, as soon as the lockdown's over, I'll come up to uh, Skeptic Headquarters. Skeptic's Headquarters, bring my little... Um, homemade sound studio which is all around me at the moment and we can record more Book of Tim's or is it Books of Tim or something like that. But for this week this is Richard Saunders signing off from lockdown in Sydney, Australia. You've been listening to the Skeptic Zone podcast. Please visit our website at www.skepticzone.tv for show notes, contacts and to access the back catalogue of episodes going back to 2008. You can follow the Skeptic Zone podcast on Twitter, at Skeptic Zone, visit our Facebook page, or leave a review on iTunes. You can also support the Skeptic Zone via Patreon or PayPal. The Skeptic Zone podcast is an independent production. The views and opinions expressed on the Skeptic Zone are not necessarily those of Australian skeptics, or any other sceptical organisation. So it should be UVP. And it might, it's not a phenomenon either, so I don't like that. Well, they are phenomena. That's, uh, we're talking that's about uh, what UAPs and UFOs and everything we should be talking about, I predictions we're not. Visual, <laughs> we can <identify> visual. <laughs> We get sidetracked every now and then, folks. Yes, it's the end of the episode. It's the Easter egg, and we're going to play the dice game. And I've got this week, and I'll hold it up to the camera, everybody, a six-sided UFO die. Look at that. Ooh. Oh, very nice. An alien. You have to rename it as a UAP die. A UAP does it die. Glow in the dark? It does. It glows in the dark. I'd turn off the lights, but... So, let's do it. It's only a six-sided die. Someone's got to come up with the right answer. What do I hear? Three. Six. 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 Everyone's six. saying six. All right, there we go. Here we go. Here it comes, folks, and you at home predict away, and it is. <laughs> How can I tilt the camera to prove, and I'll pick it up very slowly, that it's six? <laughs> this That was not a setup. It really did come. <laughs> All right, six is the first number. Predict again. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, six. Six. All right. Six. Four. Four. Right, here we go. Oh, I wish I could say six because it would be funny, but it's a three. Ooh. Last Double one. It. Yep. Double it. You Double get it. six. I mean, we're on a roll, so to speak. Okay, one more guess, everybody. Go for it. I'm sticking with six. Six? Six. Six. And what does the skeptical fairy predict? Three. Three. All right. How about that? And again, I, I'm picking it up exactly as I pick it up. Three. Hey, Michelle. Skeptical fairy got it's it. Three because it Powers. I think it was two threes in a row to make six. Mm-hmm. Well, without fudging it or cheating or anything, on episode six, 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 the dice came up with six and six, mm-hmm. sort of. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll do a supplementary. Here we go. One more. Ooh, this has to be six. What six do we... for sure. No one's no one wants to guess now, but I'll roll it anyway. Oh, six. Well, this has, to, has, to, be has six. to be a six. One. One says Michelle. All right. 
And to surprise everybody, it's a four. Four. Oh. Which is three plus one. Ooh, clever. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. All right. Well, I don't know. You're most welcome, Richard. I still wanted sixes. Good night, Thank Richard. you, Richard.